Well, greetings in the name of our risen Savior. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I'd like to begin by sharing Psalm 130. Later on in the service, you'll hear Genesis 3 read, which, which, which chronicles the fall into sin that Adam and Eve encountered that threw us all into separation from God. Listen to this psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. We do need him. We do need him. And he is waiting for us and he is coming to us today. As Michael plays this prelude, I would direct your attention to the silent prayer and the Lord richly bless you today as you worship him. Living of these days, for the living. 
living of these days. Cure your children's warring madness in our pride to your control. Shame our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us with some To the evils we deplore, let the gift of your salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving you whom we adore, serving you whom we adore. As you're able, please rise for the reading of the God. I'm sorry, for the invocation. We come together as the people of God. We offer our hearts, our voices, our lives in worship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord our God, for a day in your courts is more than a thousand elsewhere. For the Lord is a great God our Savior and Redeemer. We are the people of His pasture, the sheep under His care. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is His also. The sea is His, and He made it. His hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us take a moment of silence for personal reflection and confession. We continue. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us on the cross. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It is God's desire that we be holy as He is holy. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, the law makes us conscious of our sin. Bow down your ear, O Lord, for I am poor and needy. Your mercy is abundant to all who call upon you. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It judges the attitude and thoughts of the heart, exposing us for what we are. He knows everyone everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from Him, to whom we must explain all that we have done. Almighty God, creator of all things, judge of all people, we admit and confess that we have turned away from your path we promise to follow. We have thought evil thoughts. We have spoken unspeakable words. We have not applied your word to our behavior. Our obedience has been sloppy. Our love for our neighbor, half-hearted. Forgive us all that is past and set our feet upon the true path of life. Great is God's mercy to all who call upon Him. There is a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement for sin. And so all who believe are justified freely by His grace. God placed on Jesus all of your sins at the cross and transferred to all who believe His righteousness through faith. You're forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, where we see Adam and Eve's fall into sin. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is seen, unseen, is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. As you are able, please rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson is found in Mark chapter 3, beginning at verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons." So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. And then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, People can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. 
And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated for the singing of the message hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us share the text that's printed for us this morning. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Well, today's gospel reading brings us to a challenge very early in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus has just been baptized by John in the Jordan River and is now returning to his hometown of Capernaum. He attends a synagogue. Well, that was his normal custom on the Sabbath. As was often the case, though, he heals an individual. This was a problem for the Pharisees because Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath. Jesus was good at breaking Sabbath rules. In his book, The Bad Habits of Jesus, Leonard Sweet noted that Jesus was good at breaking Sabbath rules in order to show that the love of God was more important than the rules of religion. The Pharisees were well aware that Jesus had been healing many people. That's not the issue. He healed a paralyzed man after his friends let him down through the roof of a house. 
He healed a man with leprosy, a man with a withered arm. And the crowds were increasing. But Jesus didn't play by the rules. He broke Sabbath rules. He forgave sins. That is a prerogative of only God the Father. And a miracle-working rabbi should have nothing to do with that. It is true that the Pharisees, like all human beings, love rules. Hence, Robert's Rules of Order. Jesus was dangerous to the religious establishment, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He taught the truth about a just and a loving God. Jesus challenged the rules of the Jewish religion, which attempted to earn God's favor by keeping those laws. In our own culture, we have seen what cancel culture does to certain people. And the Pharisees were just playing the same game. They were trying everything they could to constantly discredit Jesus in the public square, cancel him, and silence his message. To cause doubt in the public mind, the Pharisees claimed that Jesus was healing people by the power of Satan. And so Jesus asked a simple question. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. The end has come. His point? The casting out of demons is a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the very power of God. The discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees is a warning against Satan's lies and God's ultimate judgment for those who reject the work of the Holy Spirit in the person of His Son, Jesus. That is the unforgivable sin. The work and miracles of Jesus cannot be separated from the Holy Spirit. All the work that Jesus does in the Gospels was accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit that was flowing through him. So to reject and blaspheme Jesus is to reject and blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That's the unforgivable sin. This event in Capernaum is just one episode in this ongoing battle over the control of the earth and God's chosen people. The cosmic battle between God and Satan, this fallen angel, began centuries ago in the Garden of Eden. This cosmic war uh, just shifted a location to the Galilean village. God's creation was perfect. Human beings were created in the perfect image of God with the ability to love and to reason and with the gift of free will. Satan hates God and hates his authority and therefore he constantly seeks to destroy God's creation and God's chosen people. The words of Jesus are a warning about rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit and then remaining in that total denial all the days of your life. You see, one of the responsibilities of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sin, our broken commandments, and then warn us about the judgment of God against sin and then lead us to repentance. Ambrose, who lived 340 to 397, was the Bishop of Milan. And he understood that the unforgivable sin was opposing the work of the Holy Spirit. Augustine, 354 to 430, dedicated at least one entire sermon to that topic. He stated that the blasphemy isn't a specific act, but a state of enmity, a state of non-repentance lasting until death always rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit that is to bring you to repentance. It's a hardness of heart, a choice Pharaoh made when confronted by Moses. The events in the words of Jesus are nice stories, but they only make sense when we understand the first few chapters of Genesis. Because in these early chapters of Genesis, well, they answer a very critical and crucial question for us. Where did we come from? And how did we get to where we are? It was a perfect world. And now today. Well, somewhere along the way, a massive change has occurred in the universe. And Genesis 1 tells us that when God finished with creation, He declared it very good. On that day, there was no crime. No poverty. No sickness. 
No death. No broken homes. No latchkey children. No abusive husbands. No drug pushers. No murderers. No child molesters. What God created was pure. It was perfect. It was pristine in its beauty. The whole earth was a place of peace and tranquility and harmony. When we continue to read, we know that something has gone wrong in the world. And when we look at our own lives, we know something has gone wrong. And now, roses have thorns. And humanity has created bombs powerful enough to kill 10 or 20 million people at a time. What has happened to God's paradise that He created? The Bible answers that question with one little word. S-I-N. Sin. Sin has happened to the world and nothing has been right or worked ever since. And the author of sin? Satan. Now there are some things we know and some things we don't know about this truth. We know that the serpent is a devil. But where did the serpent come from? How did the devil gain entry into paradise? What did the serpent look like? Did he look like a snake or did he take some other form? How could a serpent talk? And while we're on the subject, does that mean all the animals could talk before the fall? Hey, the answer to these questions is the same. I don't know. <laughs> the Bible simply doesn't give us enough information to answer those questions because there are questions, are curious questions. They don't matter to God. Or God would have told us. I believe that Eve had no idea what was about to happen. Think about it. Why should she? She's quite literally in paradise. It's perfect. She wasn't expecting to encounter a talking serpent, nor was she expecting to be tempted to commit the first sin. She wasn't looking for the serpent, but he was looking for her. When she spots the serpent, she doesn't recoil in fear. Why should she? It's paradise. There's nothing to fear in paradise. Everything and every animal was perfect. But the serpent's first move was brilliant. In essence, he challenges Eve to a game of Bible trivia. Did God really say, Satan simply was promising liberation and equality with God. But Adam and Eve would have to both doubt and then disobey God's word. They did both. What they got was slavery, sin, shame, death, and a Pandora's box of all kinds of evil things. A Pandora's box opens when human beings mess with the rules of creation. Plagues happen when human beings change the rules of God's creation, whether it is to enhance genetic viruses through gain of function or by erasing male and female genders. Satan lies. Lies are always destructive. Lie, he lies because that's his nature to lie. He was going to use and he continued to use the political power and false religions to deceive people. Those are the beasts of Revelation. He is the first and the great deceiver. And you know, all of Satan's apples have worms. In World War II, the historic city of Aachen, Germany, was surrounded by the American forces. Hitler had sent orders to the Nazi commander of that city to stand, to die, and never surrender. That was the situation when Lieutenant General Courtney Hodges sent an ultimatum to the Nazi commander and to the city's mayor. But Hodges did more. He had thousands of leaflets blown into the city by shell fire. He appealed to the troops. He pleaded with the citizens of, of Ashen to surrender and prevent unnecessary slaughter. The leaflets read, Ashen is encircled. American troops surround the city. 
The German command cannot relieve you. People of Ashen, the time has come for honorable surrender. We Americans do not wage war on innocent civilians. But if the leaders insist on further sacrifice, we have no option but to destroy your city. There is no time to lose. Our airfields, the bombers are there, and they are waiting for final orders to take off. Our military is surrounding your city. It's ready to fire. People of Ashen, act quickly. Tomorrow may be too late. There is only one choice, immediate surrender or complete destruction. Let me ask you, if you had been a citizen of that city, what would you have done? You'd been warned. Would you have listened to the warning? More importantly, would you have acted on that warning? Well, I can tell you what happened. There was no surrender. The bombers took off, the artillery fired, and the city suffered great devastation. Lives were lost and the city eventually fell. Nobody should have been surprised. The battle was over before it ever began. It was a done deal. This cosmic war, this battle for our souls was over the moment God promised Adam and Eve forgiveness. The ultimate defeat of Satan happened at the death and the resurrection of Jesus, but he continues his guerrilla war. The Father knew that if Jesus was to succeed in redeeming us, he had to become one of us. He was born like all humans. His mother's name was Mary. As a man, Jesus had to fulfill the laws that we could not. He had to resist the temptations that we do not. His death on the cross was an act of substitution. He took the punishment of God's wrath against our broken commandments. And when the Father said that the Son would die upon a cross, He meant it. Jesus promised that He would rise from death and defeat the grip of Satan and His hold over the human heart. He did. He kept His promise. God keeps His promises. And that's why you can believe Jesus when He says, don't reject the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and life. Don't reject Jesus as Savior. <coughs> Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we simply ask that you would continue to hold us in the palm of your hand. Let no one and let no false theology intrigue our mind and heart. Hold us until we're privileged to see your heavenly face. Enjoy our journey by the power of your Spirit living and working through us. May it be so. In your name, amen. amen. Let's join together in singing the next hymn that's printed for us in our order of worship.
Please rise as we share our confession of faith together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As you full well know, you can mail your donations to the church or set up automatic payments or the offering plate is in the back corner. We thank you for your love and concern. Let us pray now for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Merciful God, you promised to crush Satan forever by the death of Christ our Savior. You heard Adam and Eve as they made their meager confessions. In your grace and mercy, you did not abandon them Give us comfort by the knowledge of the forgiveness of our sins and give us hope in the promise of eternal life and your new creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our O Lord, give courage to your church that we would speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the confident hope that we have in him. Give us strength by your spirit to share our faith in Jesus. May your grace extend to more and more people who hear your word. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, your son was rejected on earth, even by his friends and relatives. Give consolation to us who feel the division brought about by our belief in Jesus. Assure us that standing for your truth is necessary. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, no kingdom divided against itself can stand, and a house divided must fall. We pray, Lord, that you would graciously preserve our nation with its government, frustrate the work of Satan and the seeds of destruction that he would sow in every place, unite our leaders and our people for the common good leading us to hope in your eternal kingdom rather than this world. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, hear our prayers for those in our church and our families who are suffering. We think especially of Pam, Howie, Doug, Matthew, Bill, Tom and Lovita, Marjorie, Phyllis, Winnie, Frank, Norma, Betty, and Janet. Do not let them lose heart, Lord, but fix their eyes on Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for those who are serving in our armed forces and as first responders. We think especially of Chris and Tate, Joshua, Ryan, Patricia, Jesse, and Zephing. Lord, I pray that you would protect them and guard them from harm's way. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Let us sing the closing hymn together, Thy Strong Word. tuned in the service to alleluia without end go in peace and serve the lord amen have a blessed week